everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Globalization in the Age of COVID-19. I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Danny Roderick, who is the Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Danny has published extensively in the area of areas of international economics, economic development, and political economy, including several books, the most recent being Straight Talk on Trade, Ideas for a Sane World Economy. Those of you who have been following INET's work know that we have been focused on the economic issues underlying populism for a while now, specifically the issues of trade and globalization, but also more broadly, the issues of inequality. The work of David Autour and others found, that, found a strong, strong statistical link between China's trade shock and the decline of manufacturing jobs in America. And further, the link between voting behavior and um, these, this decline tells a powerful political story that not many mainstream economists were open to before 2016. Danny, on the other hand, was warning us about the dangers of hyperglobalization many years before the populist backlash. The pandemic and its disruption of global supply chains has only ser served to further accelerate the backlash and calls for isolationism. I'm very eager to hear Danny's thoughts today on how we can develop a more positive vision, not only of globalization going forward, but in general, how one can actually be begin to engage the distributional effects of neoliberal, neoliberal economics, which we have been obfuscating for so long as economists. Um, Danny is going to be talking not just about globalization, but also about more structural issues. So he will be talking more broadly about reshaping economic strategy after COVID-19. Uh, so a couple of words about the structure of the webinar. Uh, Danny's going to speak for about half an hour, and we will then open it up for questions. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. You can type in your questions there, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time we have. So with that, let me turn it over to Danny. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Pierre, um, and, and thank you, Inet. It's always um, uh, nice to be um, the guest of, of, of Inet, um, um, an, an outfit that's done a lot to um, bring new thinking into, into economics, and I think all professional economists are in Inet's uh, debt. Um, so uh, originally, I had said that my talk was going to be on, on globalization, but I, I, I thought that um, I would try to present uh, a kind of a more uh, positive and actually, as, as, as Pia mentioned, more of a structural agenda for the general orientation of economic uh, policy uh, in the post-COVID uh, era. Um, and I want to sort of paint in, 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 in a broad brush uh, some of this uh, general uh, reorientation that I think um, might um, might might serve us uh, might serve us well. Um, so my my title is uh, reshaping economic um, strategy. I hope you can see my uh, my title page now. Um, and I'd like to to begin uh, by uh, making the point that. Um, I think uh, COVID-19 is, is, is largely reinforcing a pre-existing trend so rather than pointing us in a, in a completely different and unexpected direction. Um, I think there are um, three uh, such uh, major trends um, that has been going on uh, before the pandemic. Um, one, sort of move, moving away from sort of a neoliberal market fundamentalist understanding of policy to one that placed a much greater role on uh, government policy on the importance of states. Um, interestingly, uh, this was happening even on the right um, with a new brand of uh, libertarianism, new brand of uh, conservative thinkers starting to emphasize the importance of um, national uh, economic policy, the importance of the government. And of course, the left and the progressives always um, emphasizing that. But sort of, you know, if you look at, for example, um, uh, Joe Biden, who is considered to be a centrist in the Democratic Party on, on virtually um, every uh, dimension of policy, he is uh, to the left um, in terms of um, uh, emphasizing the role of, of a useful government policy compared to 
um, a, a, a platform that um, Hillary Clinton had um, four years ago. So the, the, the center of uh, the conversation has changed. Uh, secondly, um, and I think in, in parallel, um, there is a, a movement away from what I've called hyper-globalization to um, back to the nation states. Um, um, with, you know, the, of course, we have the renewed attention to uh, establishing domestic um, supply chains and uh, ensuring domestic security. Um, but again, this is a trend that predates um, the, uh, the pandemic and certainly actually predates uh, even the election of uh, President Trump, um, you know, um, that, that global value chains had begun to slow down, uh, buoyancy of world trade had come down, uh, Chinese exports as a share of GDP have actually come down significantly since the global financial crisis. So this is also an ongoing phenomenon. And in terms of overall uh, economic growth and development strategy for lower income countries or middle income countries, um, we have been already experiencing a movement away from export oriented industrialization uh, to the emergence of different types of alternative growth models that, that emphasize much more domestic demand, domestic structural change, um, and place uh, actually much less importance on industrialization, export oriented industrialization. Uh, because the ability of export-oriented industrialization to generate high growth um, has, has really become uh, much, much smaller or much weakened uh, in, in recent decades. So that's uh, as a matter of, of necessity, um, countries that have grown have grown off the back of other strategies. And um, uh, so that's uh, already a, a change that was underway, even if we forget um, the uh, the, the fact that the world economy is in, is in a deep uh, um, recession and that the world markets are not going to be very welcoming to uh, exports from developing countries in, 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 the, in the near term. Um, I think those three trends actually have one common root. Um, and I think um, that's my central diagnosis. Um, and that's why my strategy will be, the, the strategy that I'm going to be describing is one that's going to be that's going to try to tackle uh, this common root. Um, first, let me be um, uh, clear about what that root is. I've called this here a, a, a deepening economic dualism within nations. Now, of course, um, those um, uh, of us who study developing countries are are not. Uh, unfamiliar with the concept of dualism. Dualism is a feature of uh, de developing countries. Uh, what has been happening, I think, in recent times is that um, very similar features um, have now started to take hold uh, in the uh, advanced countries as well. Um, and I describe this as a, as a very stark divide between technologically advanced and globally integrated parts of uh, these economies. Um, and the lagging firms or sectors or regions. So this divide is a technological one, it's a spatial one, it's an income and social and cultural one. And often these divides are actually lining up nicely with each other, uh, dividing countries uh, into two uh, between those who are uh, um, essentially the beneficiaries of underlying trends in globalization and technology and those that have not been uh, beneficiaries. In the developing world where this divide has already have always uh, existed, I think um, the mode of participation in global markets of the last few decades through global value chains uh, and other modes of internationalization has simply reinforced that trend and it's actually quite starting how, how while uh, the most advanced firms and sectors of globalized parts of developing countries have become integrated with the rest of the economy, uh, they have become disintegrated uh, from uh, the rest of their local economies uh, without essentially growing much bigger. So, um, uh, um, you know, young people and relatively unskilled workers um, have essentially migrated into urban areas but have not found jobs uh, in these more advanced parts, more globally integrated parts of these economies, uh, ex you know, um, deepening the, the, the divide. Um, so, uh, the reason that this is the central diagnosis is that it's, it's essentially what I think explains um, all the trends or the, the three major trends is the, the driving force 
uh, behind uh, these uh, three trends that, are, that I've outlined uh, at the outset. Uh, it's obviously behind um, uh, the growing inequality and economic insecurity within countries. Uh, it's driving the backlash against hyperglobalization. And Pia, in, his, in her introductory comments, referred to the work of, of Autor and, and, and his co authors. And, and by now, actually, there's a lot of work that shows how trade shocks and occasionally financial shocks have fueled uh, the rise of. Uh, a kind of a global uh, a, a backlash against globalization and the rise of uh, authoritarian right-wing uh, groups, and I think this this um, dualization uh, or entrenching of dualization in the case of um, developing countries is also what lies behind this. Uh, it, I should say it's another feature um, or uh, uh, of a process of of deindustrialization and slowing down of the. Um, uh, export-oriented industrialization engine in the developing countries to the extent that uh, those sectors that are taking advantage of global markets are not connecting uh, with the rest of the economy. Therefore, they're not acting as a strong engine of growth because the benefits that they generate in terms of higher productivity, higher wages, higher incomes remain uh, bottled up in very narrow parts uh, of the economy. So I think this is the central diagnosis. It's, I think, what lies behind uh, these, these common trends. Just a few charts um, so that we can see that if we look at um, the advanced countries, regardless of whether we look at manufacturing or services, uh, we see a bigger gap opening up uh, between those firms that are at the uh, global productivity frontier and those uh, that are falling behind. So you can see this gap opening up. Uh, so this is the advanced country version of, uh, of, 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 of productive dualism uh, that's, taking, that's taking shape. Um, very important phenomenon uh, of um, uh, actually another uh, facet of David Autry's work is, this, is the work on labor market polarization, which is essentially the middle uh, of the labor market disappearing. Uh, this uh, sh chart shows that this is a phenomenon of labor markets, not just in the United States, uh, but also of all advanced markets, of, of all advanced economies. That is that um, uh, middle uh, um, skill um, uh, occupations are experiencing declining demand and relatively declining earnings. Um, and, and, and associated with that, of course, uh, is a middle class squeeze. Um, the middle class squeeze is, is very large in a, in, a, in a place like the United States where uh, income supports and safety nets are much weaker, uh, but it's also in evidence uh, in uh, the bulk of the advanced countries as well. So this is actually, th these data are for uh, European countries. And you can see uh, without going into the detail that after the global financial crisis in the vast majority of countries, uh, the middle class has uh, essentially has shrunk, uh, accompanying this trend of the disappearance of, of, of um, uh, middle um, jobs of middle skill, mid skill. So, um, you know, the, the crux of the matter, therefore, is uh, that the problem uh, is what one might call good jobs. Uh, good jobs are becoming scarce. Um, we don't need to spend too much time on, on discussing good jobs, uh, um, uh, but you can think of them as essentially a stable employment that enables a middle class uh, existence uh, by local standards and comes with core labor protections such as safe working conditions, collective bargaining rights, regulations against arbitrary dismissal, kind of a, a, a kind of also a career progression towards um, uh, um, uh, some, some advancement um, uh, prospectively. Um, now, and when we talk about sort of this phenomenon, which is now, I think, empirically more and more well established, uh, I think it's, it's, it's common to link this to these secular changes in technology and globalization. Um, but um, what, what I want to uh, um, take as my starting point is to say that essentially, neither technology nor globalization are exogenous processes that are outside our control. And that we can, uh, that these are in fact 
processes that we can manage and the kind of economic strategy that I'm going to be outlining is one that uh, refuses uh, to simply take technological trends as given, instead asks um, how can we engage um, in a process of uh, expanding um, good jobs and, 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 and rebuilding middle classes, uh, which for developing countries also has an implication that it's going to be growth promoting. Um, so stating the problem as, as a kind of, you know, as an economics problem, um, uh, would, uh, I would put it in this form, which is that the employment and innovation decisions uh, that shape labor demand, uh, that firms, investors, innovators engage in, uh, are the source of significant externalities, uh, which I'm going to call uh, good jobs externalities. Now, uh, these good jobs externalities, um, I think by now we have uh, significant and growing evidence that these good job externalities in terms of local communities and society at large are actually quite pervasive and that these externalities produce significant effects on social and political life. We have uh, the work that goes all the way back to uh, William Julius Wilson's 1996 book on you know, when jobs disappear, where he outlined the, the, the corrosive effects of uh, uh, deindustrialization or local employment uh, declines on the social fabric uh, of the communities in which those job declines occur. Um, and that work has been now updated and, um, uh, um, and, and, and uh, expanded uh, in, in the work of Alter, Dorn and, and Hansen. Uh, so we know that when jobs disappear, when good jobs disappear, um, uh, broken families, uh, crime, drug abuse, uh, um, mortality rates to uh, increase. The recent book by um, Angus Deaton and Anne Case, of course, on, on, um, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a very um, a poignant um, uh, exposition of the social costs of, of good jobs disappearing. Um, politically, um, we have uh, the consequences of political polarization and the rise of populist parties. And, and again, going back to uh, the point that Pia made, uh, we know that when jobs disappear, and this could be due to trade shocks, it could be due to technology automation, uh, that they um, produce significant uh, adverse political consequences in terms of support for authoritarian populist parties, uh, support for political polarization. And there is also some work uh, that suggests that there might be longer term effects of uh, jobs disappearing uh, in terms of uh, the kinds of values or cultural attitudes uh, that that um, promotes, um, in particular, the rise of authoritarian values. Uh, that is looking up for sort of big you know, leaders, um, uh, authoritarian leaders that might solve our problems. So these social, political, attitudinal costs are, are severe. Uh, but there is also what one might call sort of an economic externality or implication for economic performance and productivity growth um, in general, uh, which is that when uh, the middle sort of when there's this, when the, there, were, there aren't enough good jobs uh, being produced, it's also an indicator of an indication uh, that um, the most productive sectors, the most advanced technologies aren't essentially disseminating throughout the rest of the society. Uh, because uh, for productive new, new, new inventions, new technologies to have a, a, a significant effect on total factor productivity and economy to show up as aggregate economic growth, uh, you need those innovations, those innovative sectors uh, to absorb larger and larger uh, segments uh, of uh, the labor force, of the resources of the economy uh, for these things to disseminate throughout the rest of the economy. Uh, but the disappearance of good jobs means that essentially these uh, innovative sectors uh, are not uh, absorbing uh, labor from, from the rest of the economy. So what that means is that when you put those two strands together, uh, it also means that that we no longer have to separate out the social agenda and the growth agendas from each other or the economic agenda and the social agenda, because really the only way you can get greater 
inclusion, uh, less inequality, greater economic security, is by creating better jobs, more productive jobs for um, uh, you know uh, people of uh, mid or, or, or less skill. On the other hand, you know the only way you can actually sort of get growth uh, is by ensuring that the workers that you currently have are being absorbed into the more productive parts of the economy. Uh, so one key argument that I want to make uh, is that basically thinking about our problem. Uh, from this perspective of good jobs and good jobs externalities to a large extent joins the social and economic agendas and makes them uh, one, uh, one issue, one problem. Um, uh, and therefore the remedies are, um, are going to be um, a, a range of uh, policies that you know, I um, uh, would summarize under sort of um, three headings. Um, one is, uh, policies that directly uh, target the supply of good jobs uh, that will come through increasing the productive employment capacity of existing firms. Uh, it could come through increasing the number of firms uh, with productive employment, either through entry or from other jurisdictions. Um, and uh, workforce development policies that uh, target the capabilities of the local labor force. Uh, secondly, um, policies uh, that are at the national or enterprise level uh, that uh, explicitly redirect innovation in a more friendly uh, direction. That is to say, rather than simply taking the direction of technological change as given, um, uh, uh, exploiting the fact that um, technological change is always directed, um, as I'll um, say more about this in, in, a, in, in a minute, uh, but uh, given the, that um, that the direction of technological change is at least partly endogenous, uh, there might be institutional changes and policies that would make uh, the, um, the, uh, that direction more friendly to employment rather than uh, employment uh, re uh, displacing. Um, I think uh, one sort of uh, way of combining these two, uh, um, these two, uh, legs of uh, policies that increase supply of good jobs and policies that target innovation uh, is to think in terms of um, modern industrial policies um, and uh, uh, modern in the sense that um, uh, that I'm going to make clearer in a second um, and also um, that you know industrial policies but not necessarily confined to manufacturing per se. Um, and I think that sort of uh, is, is another uh, important qualification. But so I'm going to, to try to, uh, to develop this idea a little bit more um, in, in a second. So I think you know, the, the best way to, uh, to, I think, to perhaps explain what I have in mind is uh, by drawing some distinctions. Uh, and that's what I want to do. Um, uh, I want to distinguish. Um, the kind of policy framework that I'm advocating uh, from uh, first from traditional conceptions of welfare state policies. Um, so it's going to be a different approach to social inclusion than the welfare state. Uh, second, uh, I want to distinguish it from our, the conventional understanding of the relationship between technology and labor markets. And I've already signaled this. Um, and, and third, uh, I want to distinguish it from the uh, the traditional or conventional way in which economists approach uh, regulating market economies, okay? So those are the three dimensions along which um, what I'm suggesting I think is different or novel or represents a departure. So let me say uh, a little bit about uh, each one of these three elements. Um, first, with respect to how this would differ from traditional policies uh, of welfare state or, or social inclusion policies. Um, I find it useful to talk about policies of uh, that target inequality or, or exclusion uh, with the help of a matrix like this, of this kind. Uh, at the top, uh, so there are two questions uh, in the, on this matrix. One is, at, you know, at what point of the economy does policy intervene? Um, uh, typically in discussions about inequality, we make a, dis a distinction between uh, pre-distribution and um, uh, redistribution. 
I, I actually want to make a threefold distinction uh, that relates to the stage of the economy with respect to production. So I want to say about sort of the pre-production stage of the economy, that it's before labor and capital and resources are put into production. The production stage where employment, innovation, production decisions are made and post-production after firms and have made those decisions. So those are three different stages of the economy. Um, the second dimension is the answer to the question, uh, what kind of inequality do we care about? Do we care about most about people at the very bottom of the distribution? Do we care about people at the very top or do we care about uh, people in the middle? Um, so we can actually, um, uh, you know, we have a wide range of policies and these are examples uh, of either existing examples from the United States or some policy proposals um, uh, about uh, that fills out essentially the entire matrix. Um, so um, if you're focusing on health education policies uh, and in increasing access to health and education uh, for uh, um, sort of the, the uh, people at low levels of income, uh, then you're essentially in the top uh, left-hand side uh, cell. Wealth taxes are sort of diagonal, diagonally at the opposite end, uh, which is basically redistributing after production, but that's sort of really targeting at the very top end of the distribution. Um, now, the traditional uh, welfare state model uh, is one that is based, essentially focuses on pre-production and post-production. That is to say, it has two legs. One is to increase the endowments of, with which individuals enter markets. That is to increase uh, investments in education and training, both for uh, primary schools, but also for you know, public spending on higher education. And secondly, uh, to uh, engage in policies, both of redistribution and social insurance. So through transfers, fiscal redistribution, and safety nets and social pro uh, protection. Um, so there is an updated version of this. Uh, welfare state has changed along the way. But if you look, for example, at the, the most recent uh, um, account of the OECD, their future of work report and what they recommend, uh, it's really the emphasis is on first on adult learning. So you get you know, people to, you know, uh, to uh, be able to work with new technologies. And secondly, sort of, you know, revamped social protection to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. But once again, the focus is uh, in the pre-production and the post-production state. Now, I think um, while the welfare state model uh, has served us well, um, I think there's a, there's a presumption here uh, that uh, the good jobs or middle-class jobs are going to be available essentially to most people with adequate education. Uh, so you focus first on, uh, on, on spending on education, and then also uh, to ensure that nobody falls to the cracks, you, you, you engage in social insurance programs to take care of uh, idiosyncratic risks. And that's the logic behind the welfare state. Improve endowments on the one hand, and then uh, take care of idiosyncratic risks uh, through social insurance. And these are uh, policies that lie in the pre-production and post-production column in terms of the above matrix. I'd like to suggest that uh, to the extent that economic insecurity and inequality today is a structural problem that is driven by ongoing trends in technology and globalization, uh, that uh, these, the traditional welfare state policies cannot address the core problem, which is the disappearance of, of, of good jobs. So when technology and globalization follow out the middle of the employment distribution, we have a structural problem. Uh, the structural problem that's going to exhibit itself in the form of permanently bad jobs and permanently depressed regional labor markets. So I think we need a different strategy that tackles good job creation directly. And that's the sense which I think um, what I'm suggesting, uh, which is to, to essentially focus uh, much more directly in the middle column, and in particular, the, the, the cell at the center of the table. Uh, I want to call this a, a productivist model, a good jobs model, good jobs welfare state model. Uh, if you have a good title, let me know and, and I will use it. Uh, but it, 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 so that's sort of my, that's the first distinction that I wanted to emphasize in terms of where the focus of policies goes. It goes, uh, in, it goes directly 
uh, in the production column. Um, so what does that mean? It means working directly with employers, investors, innovators uh, to try to change uh, their incentives, their decisions. Uh, some of it can be done through labor laws, um, uh, uh, through increasing the power of labor uh, on the workforce, through competition and antitrust policies, uh, um, sectoral wage agreements. Um, some of it is going to, however, come in the form of what used to be called industrial policy, which is to engage firms directly uh, in a kind of a dialogue where you're engaged in, in changing their, um, their, their incentives uh, um, in terms of doing one thing as opposed to another, and in this case, uh, to increase their incentives to um, expand uh, the supply of good jobs. Uh, the second uh, dimension on which uh, this, what I'm suggesting is a, de is a departure, uh, is a rethinking of the relationship between technology and labor markets. Now, the conventional account here about you know, the, the implication of technology for labor markets essentially takes uh, technology as being completely an exogenous process. So here's a paraphrase of the kind of, of a sentence that you must have seen at least hundreds of times, or you will see if you read any kind of report on this uh, topic. And it goes something like this. Technology is rapidly changing the skills needed on the job and workers need to adjust to increase education and continuous training. So technology is just you know, something that's happening out there and then workers need to adjust uh, to uh, that technology through appropriate skilling. Uh, treats technology as an exogenous force. Uh, but I think now there is increasing a recognition uh, in economics as well, uh, that the direction of technology responds to uh, a lot of other things. You, you know, um, Darona Jamolu and Pascal Restrepo, among others, have done some very good work on this, uh, just uh, arguing that uh, we need to take both that the direction of technological change is endogenous, responds to incentives, and that we should take advantage of it uh, to create uh, more better jobs. So I think there are at least three levels of, uh, of, of, of possible intervention there. Uh, one is with respect to direct incentives. So there are many incentives embedded in our current uh, um, innovation systems, current tax structure uh, that skew the incentives against uh, employment-friendly technologies. The clearest of that is you know, the, the fact that you know, a physical capital is subsidized whereas employment is taxed. Um, and therefore, you know, from the get-go, you're giving innovators an incentive uh, to save on labor. R&D subsidies typically are um, also uh, very skewed. The second level is in terms of, of norms about you know, what kind of, you know, what kind of, of technology um, uh, do you want to, to invest in? Um, and I think those are norms are, are embedded in our in our innovation systems or uh, from sort of what part of the government runs innovation. So in the United States, DARPA is a big uh, stimulus behind innovation, but that's a defense related agency. So they focus, they put their efforts on defense related technologies. Um, and the question of what that will do to employment uh, is not one that they pay particular attention to. It would be very different if we had um, a kind of uh, um, as, for example, a recent um, bill by Schumer and Young um, uh, advocates, we should have a, um, a, a DARPA-like um, effort uh, that's run out of um, a new uh, technology agency, uh, which is taking jobs much more directly uh, into account in, in, in funding innovation. Um, and, and third, I think, um, equally importantly, uh, since you know, the, how te which technologies get developed and how they deployed in the workplace also depends on who has a say, who has relative power. Um, so, you know, we see this, for example, when Google employees um, essentially organize uh, to prevent the company from engaging in the development of new technologies of, let's say, you know, uh, facial recognition that's going to help police agencies. Um, so that's an objection from within the company saying that, this is not the kind of technology we want to invest in. This is not what we are. I think by changing power, uh, you can imagine that uh, when workers have more power on the workplace, 
that they would have more say on what type of technologies are, are deployed. Um, so uh, I think we're only at the beginning of uh, thinking uh, along this line. So I think um, uh, we need to invest a lot more thinking, but the basic point here uh, is that we need to, uh, when we think about technology and innovation, um, we need to put employment, an emphasis on employment uh, uh, friendly technologies in a way that is simply not happening today. Uh, um, uh, whether you talk about you know, in Europe, the European Green Deal, which is appropriately focused on uh, green technologies and climate change, uh, or with respect to in much of the discussion about responding to the Chinese um, uh, technological competition in the US, which is much more focused about catch, you know, so ensuring technological supremacy. Um, I think you know, looking at, at, at the innovation policies from the perspective of how they can be much more directly employment friendly uh, can change the calculus in ways that, that would uh, make a big difference. Um, and, and finally, sort of the, the you know, the, the third plank of this is in terms of a new relationship uh, between the government um, and, and the economy, uh, a new type of, of, of industrial policy. And, and, uh, and here, the distinction is really from the, from the traditional way in which economists think about uh, government policy, which is a kind of an arm's length kind of regulation that the government simply sets a bunch of uh, you know, taxes and regulations and then keeps the private sector at arm's length. Um, the industrial policy equivalent of this is what I've called here the traditional model of industrial policy, um, where uh, you know, the government ex ante selects a number of sectors for promotion, ex ante selects a number of instruments of promotion, such as tax incentives or, um, or, or export subsidies. Um, and then, you know, that's what um, uh, the industrial policy consists of. Whereas the more contemporary, modern, or um, uh, uh, types of industrial policy uh, is, a, is much more of, a, of an ongoing collaboration, uh, presumes much less ex ante knowledge on the part of the regulators or the government or the development agencies about where the problems are, what type of activities to promote, uh, and what type of instruments are going to be um, the most uh, appropriate for doing so. Uh, so the identification of, of, of objectives of constraints uh, um, happens through an ongoing process of collaboration. Uh, so the emphasis is on learning, on iteration, on experimentation, uh, on monitoring the consequences of what you're doing and changing course and revising policy um, as, uh, as um, as you go along. Uh, so this has the advantage that it has the capacity to elicit and generate much more information uh, along the way, and also ensure that the criterion for success isn't, are you able to pick winners, which you are not, unless you happen to be South Korea and Taiwan, um, but the criterion for success instead becomes a much weaker one, which is, are you able to uh, let losers go? So in other words, through the information uh, you're figuring out, are you able to revise your policies in a way that you can minimize your losses and focus on the areas where you actually can make some, some gains? Uh, this may sound like, um, uh, I'll skip this, this may sound a bit like uh, pie in the sky, um, uh, and, uh, but the fact is that this is already something that is being done. Um, I think this model of uh, collaborative, iterative um, uh, um, problem solving uh, that involves both the private sector um, and the public sector already takes place. Uh, even in the United States in the context of DARPA, uh, it's a uh, much smaller uh, cousin ARPA-E. Uh, it's taking place in US in manufacturing institutes. Um, the new 100 billion plus um, uh, industrial policy proposal that I just mentioned briefly from Senator Schumer and Young uh, explicitly builds on this model. So there is actually um, a, a, uh, an initiative on the table. Um, those are all sort of national level federal initiatives. Uh, they're also very sort of local initiatives that are much more narrowly targeted on workforce development. Um, and probably the best known of that is US project in the US is Project Quest 
which has been very successful at getting disadvantaged youth by working them closely with them and also with potential employers uh, to skill them and get them uh, um, to uh, train them uh, in local community colleges um, and, and, and put them in, in better jobs than they would have otherwise. Uh, uh, that's a, a model of the kind of extended uh, uh, labor market or, or workforce development interventions that one can think of uh, that has some partnership in a, in a current version, has some partnership uh, with um, employers, but I think that part, that partnership with the employer part could be developed to a much greater extent. And then there are a number of other examples, uh, even in, in countries that we don't think actually can manage industrial policy very well, such as Argentina, that there are some parts, uh, such as in you know, the approach to agricultural technology, where in fact they have been uh, quite successful. So I think um, I will just um, end uh, with this uh, final uh, slide. Um, I think the kind of approach that I'm suggesting here has a number of advantages. Uh, first, it directly focuses on structure, uh, which is, um, you know, there are a lot of different reasons why we might have inequality in a society, uh, but they are always being in, reinforced and, re and entrenched uh, in the course of production uh, on a day in day out basis. And I think the best way to actually address these problems is through the structure of production per se. Um, I think sort of the, the model of policy making that, that I've advocated uh, essentially does away with this sort of traditional um, debates between markets and the state um, uh, that the, the model of collaborative iterative rule making under uh, this kind of uncertainty is one where you understand that there was um, you know that there are uh, there's, there's an important role for both of them and here maybe I'll just show very quick, quickly the slide that that uh, I skipped which is this the quid pro quo here between the private sector and the government agencies is that firms need the public sector. They need access to a stable, skilled workforce, reliable infrastructure, reliable legal um, uh, um, uh, enforcement and contracts and that kind of technological infrastructure. Uh, because these problems, because these requirements pose collective action problems, they're typically provided by the government. And that's where the, um, uh, the dependence of success uh, depend is 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 uh, on on uh, effective government action is so important, but on the other side, uh, governments also need firms to internalize what I've called these good job externalities in the decisions they make with respect to, you know, job classifications, uh, job creation, the type of technology they invest in, and and so, and, and so forth. Um, um, so this, this third is this merging of the, the social and economic agendas uh, that I've already uh, mentioned, that, that when you look at the problem from this perspective, there's no longer, you know, part of your government is trying to maximize growth and the other part is trying to ensure that it's, it's well distributed. If you do it through this way, you're going to get both. Um, and, and finally, I think uh, it, it cuts through this sort of old debate between, uh, you know, uh, incremental change versus revolution, uh, because this is a kind of strategy that has the possibilities of producing a significantly different institutional structure down the path, down the way, but doesn't presume that you're just making that big leap from the very outset. So you can start from your existing uh, institutional structure, uh, but could, uh, that could lead to a, a much bigger transformation down the way. Okay, so uh, that's a lot, um, and, um, and there's also obviously a lot that um, uh, uh, you know I don't quite have a good uh, um, uh, um, grasp of, and, and I can only so. Um, but I wanted to to present this as a as a kind of a, a general approach um, to um, what I think is, is, is the key problem. So let me just stop here. Danny, thank you. Um, as usual, you have a way of uh, setting up and analyzing a problem that brings deep clarity to many of the issues that we're dealing with and putting it into a broader structural framework. And much of what you said really resonated. Um, 
if I think about the work that INET has been supporting, Peter Temin, I think back in 2015, 2016, was talking about uh, problems with the dual economy, which I think specifically talks about the issues of the fact that we've dropped the middle class and because we don't have some place to push people when we have um, when we restructure education we're not really thinking about the problem structurally so this was a very helpful way to think about it um, a few months ago right before the shutdown we organized a conference where we were trying to think about the future of work um, and some of our thinking was economists do tend to get bogged down in this argument of how much of the problem is coming from globalization and trade and the export of jobs and how much of it is coming through automation and technology. And, you know, there's this, what I see is somewhat useless exercise of trying to assign a percentage to each of them. And as you point out, it doesn't make sense to think of them separately. But one of the things that was very clear that came out of our conference was that if you look at what's happening with technology and its interaction with the labor market, we're seeing the technologies we have today shifting us further and further back in terms of what we're trying to achieve with respect to the Gini coefficient. So rather than technology moving us towards the place that we want to go, I think we're looking at problems like what David Wilde has referred to as the fissured economy, where increasingly you're seeing um, you know, the split in uh, the in corporations and firms as a result of increased technology. And I think if I were to try and understand what's going on here, I would ask the question, what, what is the political economy? I believe the same political economy that has driven the issues that we have seen with globalization, where neoliberal economics was very clear about the positive aspects of trade without trying to really understand the redistributional effects, are we not going to run into the same political economy issues when we look at technology and innovation? And, um, you know, it's very clear that we can use tax policy and some of these other industrial policies that you talk about to try and address the issues we're seeing. But instead, we're looking at monopolies like Google and Amazon, and we're seeing the political influence that they have so that it's becoming increasingly harder for us to set into place any kind of industrial policy that's actually gonna shift us towards a more genie negative um, environment. Are we not dealing with exactly the same political economy issues in the technological spectrum that we've dealt with in the globalization uh, spectrum? That's a, that's a very good question. I think you know, I would say um, that, that the that the, the underlying structure of the problem uh, is, is, is the same uh, with two differences on, on, you know, on, the, on the, one is that quantitatively, um, the, the, the effect of technology on labor markets is probably much bigger going forward. So this is going to be, if globalization was a shock, you know, I think technology is going to be even bigger one going forward, at least relative to globalization. Um, secondly, but which might be you know compensating, uh, is that uh, you know the the elasticity. Let me pull it. You know the elasticity of the kind of backlash to um, trade seems to be much greater than the elasticity of backlash to labor displacing technology. Uh, so on the one hand, the shock is bigger, but you know, at least so far, the response to technological displacement of labor hasn't been as large. Let me leave that aside. But I mean, I think the basic problem, the basic question you're you're asking is, how do we avoid this? Um, the uh, I think we need to to avoid it by by you know we need to. Um, I mean, first we need to use our terms and our language carefully. Um, it's remarkable how all the underlying maintained assumption behind the future of work kind of efforts is really, you know, how can we get labor to adjust itself to technology? Mm -hmm. But this is, you know, this to me is, is, is not the right starting point at all. I mean, technology is there to benefit society. You know, it's not, it doesn't sort of fall into our lap. Um, and we are not 
uh, you know, spending nearly enough time and, and resources we need to, to ask the other question, which is how can technology serve the needs of our existing labor markets? I mean, my colleague, uh, Ricardo Hossman has a nice uh, um, uh, phrase, which I use, you know, that, you know, you, you, you know, the problem is not to solve the problems that we, of the, you know, the labor market, the labor market you wish you had. The problem is to solve the, you know, the, 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 you have to solve the problems of the workers you have currently, not the ones that you wish you had. Um, and therefore, your technological choices have to be appropriate uh, to the workforce that you have. Now, that raises the question of, you know, if, you know, sort of, you know, if, if the structure of incentives, you know, firms, you know, platforms are making their own decisions, regardless, are we ever going to get to a better equilibrium? I think better, you know, I think, you know, moving from one equilibrium to another is always, you know, a mixture of, of two things. One is the structure of vested interests and, you know, maybe platform monopolies have an interest in having more control over what they do. And that's going to require a different kind of technology and maybe not one that is inclusive to labor. Uh, but the other part is, is ideas and narratives. I mean, I think the reason that the narrative on globalization has changed is because, you know, partly because of what we have found, partly because of the backlash. I mean, the whole nar narrative about how we deal with technology you know, globalization has changed. And I think we need a kind of a similar transformation uh, about the, the narrative um, on technology that, that, you know, basically you know, emphasizes that technology has to benefit <laughs> the society and labor. It's not that labor has to prepare itself for technology. It's that the technology has to be suitable uh, to um, uh, our, 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 the, the workers that we have currently. And that means uh, taking on board very seriously this endogeneity of the direction of technological change. And it's not just going to be through, you know, price incentives and, and reforming taxes. It's also going to be by, I think, giving labor more power. I think that's, then, then we're go, going back to the interests, right? La you know, you need to give labor more power at the enterprise level. You need to give labor more power at the national level. Uh, so you can have, you know, this dynamic between interests and ideas or narratives uh, moving you in, 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 in the right direction. So that's, I mean, that's how, you know, I hope uh, it, it's going to happen because otherwise I think uh, the problems that are created by current technological trends are even more serious going forward than, than what we had with globalization. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think so much of this really boils down to what kind of leverage does the labor market uh, does labor have in terms of setting the terms uh, for the for the government and the direction of innovation. Uh, I'm going to turn now to some of the questions that have come in. Uh, that we have we have five minutes left, so <laughs> you better pick the good one. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll do my best. Um, I have a question here from Vandana Gyanchandrani. Has COVID-19 reimagined the linkages between national policies or tools to resolve rising inequalities in the, um, and the role of economic globalization in society? Yeah, I mean, I, without question, I mean, the, the pandemic, I think, has been sort of like a magnifying glass, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's held the, all of our problems now are you know, visible to the naked eye, you know, sort of, and, and all of them have become, you know, worse. Uh, and, and, and so I think, you know, there is a need, you know, people are, I, mean, I think governments are going to be forced to respond. I think the pressure from below is going to be very strong. Um, you know, whether this will actually result in change, it's very hard to say because, in, you know, we went through more, a bit over a decade ago, we went through the global financial crisis, which was the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression. And remarkably little changed after that. Um, and this is a bit of a bigger crisis. And uh, uh, maybe again, uh, much will not change. But so, so I don't know, I mean, it depends. I, I myself, I'm not clear as to whether you know, the momentum here is going to be um, sufficiently strong and it will be met by political leaders who um, have a good um, good take on what needs to be done. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here from Kathleen Stephenson. Would you see labor unions as key economic agents enhancing collaboration between government and the private sector? 
I definitely, I mean, yes, but I, I think we need to go beyond labor unions. I mean, I think that we have to find alternative instruments. And labor unions may not be the right way uh, to increase uh, worker voice in, in the gig economy. Uh, you know, one idea that I'm attracted to is the idea of uh, sectoral uh, wage boards, which, you know, basically, regardless of whether you're a member of a union or not, that there are sort of uh, uh, discussions on employment conditions at the sectoral level uh, between uh, firms and uh, uh, and and and, uh, and 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 uh, you know representatives of workers, but all in the government that sets work standards, wage and other uh, labor standards at the sectoral level. Um, so there, you know, I think we need to. There are there are proposals to directly give workers much more voice by splitting the governance of firms to have workers have equal 50% of the voting share. Um, uh, so there, you know, I think we'll need to, alter we'll need to experiment. Uh, I don't think there's going to be just one remedy and I don't think labor unions alone are going to do it. Uh, I have another question about trade. Carmen Naidu asks, can you talk more about reduced global trade? What is the implication for African countries that have small local markets for manufactured goods? Yeah, you know, I, I, if what I'm saying is correct, um, you know, I don't think even if they have exporting, getting growth and inclusive development through exporting manufacturers, frankly, I don't see any country doing it, uh, even in the best of times. So I, I just, I think the good jobs will have to come through increased productivity, mostly in services for the home market. Um, so I think uh, it's a much harder model of, of development than simply um, getting a few manufacturing sectors off the ground and hoping that they would, you know, grow and absorb employment because that's not going to happen. So um, I don't think the size of the uh, domestic market is, is the issue at all. The, the issue is we really actually don't know what the contemporary equivalent of um, contemporary version of an export or you know sort of a growth model is when you know the 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 growth model that has been essentially the only model that we have for sustained growth and development which is industrialization when that is no longer working yeah um we have i, I think time for one more question uh we have one from anisha chitkupi Given the close nexus between technology and globalization, how much bargaining power do you think developed countries uh, have, technology importers, in applying productivist approach? Do you propose to channelize technology towards good job creation? Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the creators of technology are the advanced countries. So when I talk about redirecting uh, uh, innovation in a more employment friendly direction, that's really a message uh, mostly to the United States and, and Europe and to some extent maybe China a little bit. Most developing countries are, are, are technology takers. And I think increasingly uh, as technology has become more skill in intensive, it's more complementary to skill and more uh, capital intensive, I think developing countries have effectively have lost out. And we see this, I mean, that, that their comparative advantage in manufacturing has gone down because I mean, to put it very starkly, if you can manufacture shoes using 3D printing with advanced capital equipment, uh, you're not going to put your factory in a developing country anymore. It's going to be in Germany. Um, and, and so, you know, you're not going to be exporting, um, uh, 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 you know, shoes uh, from a low cost uh, labor abundant environment. That, that has been now going on for, for quite some time. And unfortunately, developing countries don't have much say in this. But I think developed countries, advanced countries for their own interests and for reasons I've tried to explain in my presentation, um, have uh, a, 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 a known interest uh, in, uh, in, in, in pushing, direct, pushing innovation in a more employment friendly direction. But I have to say that this is not going to help developing countries a lot uh, because I don't think that, uh, that you know, um, manufacturing is going to be a source of a lot of employment creation in the developing world. Okay. Well, Danny, I want to thank you for taking the time to um, discuss these issues with us. There's a tremendous amount here. Um, if, 
for those of you watching, if you want to uh, look at Danny's slides, they should be available on the INET website and there should be a recording of this up on the website in a couple of days. Uh, so I want to thank all of you also for joining us and uh, I hope you will tune in next Thursday at noon Eastern for our next webinar, which will be a conversation between INET President Rob Johnson and uh, Jesse Isinger, who is a senior report and editor at ProPublica. Uh, Jesse has been tracking where the COVID-19 bailout money has been going. So I imagine that's going to be another important lesson in political economy for all of us. Uh, you can register for that on the INET website. And uh, Danny, thank you once again. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.